All rise. Please be seated. <clears throat> yes, uh, Mr. Grievous. May it please your honours. Mr. Taylor, just before lunch, I rather prematurely placed before you a map. But um, before we come to the map, I think we need to lay a bit more groundwork. Now, Upon your release, following that second incarceration in Ghana, did you travel anywhere outside Africa? After my release from Ghana, I went straight to... Uh, I went straight to Ivory Coast. Then I went to Burkina Faso. I uh, verified my trip into, I uh, went into Libya to see the situation of the men, return, and then before I went to uh, France. Why did you go to France? <clears throat> I did not put the second MPFL together alone. Uh, this second MPFL was put together by those of us, I remember saying to the court, there was a group in La Côte d'Ivoire. Now, <clears throat> working along with us in La Côte d'Ivoire was a gentleman uh, called uh, Tony King, Pause there, please. How do you spell the first name? Tony. Uh, T O is the vine name. T O N Y I A, I want to believe. Uh, if it's wrong, we can correct it on another day. Uh, working with me outside, and, the, and may I just emphasize, Tony went along for some time, but once the Libyan uh, connection was uh, cemented, uh, Tony and broke away from us. He no longer participated. But two others remain. There's a gentleman called Tom Wuyu. We mentioned that on yesterday. That's W O W E I Y U. And the present president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Uh, the three of us are finally. Uh, uh, were the individuals that put the MPFL together. So upon leaving Ghana, I had traveled to Paris to meet with Ellen Johnson and Tom you in Paris. And uh, when you say that the current president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, was <laughs> one of the organizers, in what way did she assist? Oh, Ellen. <clears throat> Ellen is an old revolutionary. She, she's she been involved in, uh, she was involved in part with the first MPFL. That was not new to Ellen. Which first MPFL? I remember I told the court that uh, the first invasion into Liberia that was launched by General Kuwampa was called the MPFL. And this second, uh, or maybe it's better to say this continuation of the MPFL, uh, Ellen was also a very good part of it because Ellen was also a very close friend of General Kuwampa. So she was involved in the Kuwampa crew? Well, I am, you know, when you hear me say she was involved, I, I will not be able to give you all of the details because I, I, I'm sure that, you know, from the prosecution questions will come, I was out, but I know she was close to Kuwampa and the extent of her involvement, if I'm pressed on this, I wouldn't be able to give you the extent. But I do know she was uh, associated with Kuwampa. She associated with the training outside where she knew about it, okay? And she knew about ours. But in my case, she was really involved in helping me financially. Financially how?
Oh, Ellen raised money throughout uh, while the training was going on. In fact, uh, I had taken the first two picture groups uh, to her in, in, in Paris. She had then moved to, to the United States. The first two what? Picture groups. The first group, remember I mentioned here just before uh, the break, that the trainees went into groups. The first two groups had gone, and I did mention that in the second group was Moses Blah, or Blah. We had pictures of these combatants. So I flew into Paris. We met at Orly Airport, in fact, at the Holiday Inn Hotel at Orly Airport, where I was. She came, and I showed her the, the two sets of pictures. Uh, she was very, very pleased. And then now uh, this was really to convince her that her efforts were not being wasted in, in what she was doing. And by that I mean she was doing two things. Uh, Ellen raised most of the money that we needed for all of this movement in the early stage and even doing combat. And secondly, I now cannot go back to the United States. She is if I'm not mistaken, is working with uh, a bank somewhere in uh, the Washington, D.C. area and has uh, tremendous contacts. So we use Ellen to uh, do our so-called diplomatic contacts outside and to raise money. Now, another name you mentioned was uh, Tom Wuiu. That is correct. Can I inquire whether we have a spelling for that name? Yes, we do. <clears throat> now, you recall, do you recall telling us that um, he was a member of the union, ULAA? That is correct. And when did you first come across him? Oh, I first uh, met Tom in uh, <clears throat> the early 70s, around 1972. Where? In the United States when I arrived. And uh, this process of trying to, uh, to put together the different organizations that I explained to the court in different parts of the United States, uh, Tom was uh, stationed in uh, the state of New Jersey. Uh, one of the largest chapters of the Union and was very uh, influential in, in working with uh, different groups uh, in the New York, New Jersey area. Now, did he remain in the United States during this period we're concerned with now when you're traveling around West Africa to put the NPFL together? No, no, no. <clears throat> Tom made several our trips to West Africa, even before the men were moved, moved to Libya. He made several trips. We were in and going through the organizational phase of this, so he made several trips during the organizational phase. Uh, Ellen did not come to West Africa to see me during the, this phase of putting men together. She was busy in Washington. But, you know, Tom was in direct contact with her, and whatever little funds she could raise, he would bring it down. We moved to Libya. Tom is still coming in and out. He goes to Libya many, many times, even when I can't be there because I do not live in Libya. I want to visit the camp, maybe for a day or two, leave at the Mataba, come back. Tom is moving up and down, uh, but Ellen doesn't come. Now, so we've dealt with Tom Wuyu. I just want to ask you a little bit more, please, about Ellen Johnson Surly. When did you first met her? Oh, Ellen. <clears throat> Ellen was uh, in Liberia uh, during the, uh, uh, the cool uh, years of uh, 1980. Ellen was there. Ellen had an apartment uh, at a penthouse on Broad Street at top of the Ministry of Education building. So she was there. Uh, she went and came and, was, and became very friendly, and very, very friendly. With who? With General Thomas Kuwampa. 
And what, uh, what about you? Were oh. you friends with her? Oh yes, I knew Ellen at that time, exactly. I, because Ku Wang Pang went nowhere almost without me, of course. We yeah. got to know each other then. Yes, my question is very simple. Were you friends with her? Well, I would say yes, uh, because she was very close to my friend General Ku Wang Pang, so we became friends. And what about Johnson Sirleaf's relationship with Doe? No, to the best of my uh, recollection, Ellen really never got along with Doe. And what happened to Ellen after the October 1985 elections in Liberia? Oh, uh, <clears throat> to the best of my recollection, I think Ellen was arrested. Uh, she by whom? By Samuel Doe, who was the uh, president. And uh, I understand that she managed to get out, I don't know how, uh, of Liberia. And uh, she was saved by some, I understand, some uh, mutual friends. It is believed that she was helped by a gentleman, a very good friend of hers, or at least I hope they are still friends, uh, called Gabriel Doe, I understand, assisted in getting her out of the country uh, when she got out of uh, prison. Now, so, putting all of this together, who were the main people in putting together this second NPFO? Ellen Johnson, Sirleaf, Charles, Ganke, Taylor, and Tummins. Who were you? Finally. What, were there others involved in an organizational capacity? <coughs> Not really. Not really. I just mentioned to the court that there were others that dropped, including the gentleman I mentioned, Tony and King. Uh, he dropped aside because he just wouldn't go to Libya. He was just frightened he wouldn't go there. We're talking about the Cold War period, and that, that, that name, Libya, was almost like Black Snake. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, we, we, <clears throat> we appreciated Libya for what they were doing. Uh, supporting the whole pan-African idea, so uh, we were not frightened to be labeled whatever they wanted to call us. Now, Tonya King, what was, what was his background? Uh, Tonya King uh, is married to the daughter of the late President uh, William Ira Talbot that we discussed here that was killed in the coup d'etat by Doe. Uh, and immediately thereafter, he uh, settled in La Côte d'Ivoire. Now, was Tonya King in a position to provide any particular assistance to those seeking to put together the NPFL? Oh, definitely. Uh, Tonya assisted uh, in providing little food, uh, the contact, he's in La Côte d'Ivoire living with his wife. He's known by all of the senior people in the Ivorian establishment. Why? Remember I spoke about Daisy being married to, uh, to uh, uh, A.B. Talbot, the son of the late William Ira Talbot, whose sister is married now to Tony King. So there is sympathy in the establishment for uh, that family in total. Mm. And so uh, he helps substantially. He helps in whatever way he can. And I'm saying to you, he breaks away at the Libyan part that apparently he just couldn't take, I guess. What a, apart from contacts with the Ivorian establishment, did he have any other contacts in? Cote d'Ivoire? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, Tonya uh, uh, had been a, a very... He was trained in the intelligence field. In fact, at the time of the, of the coup d'etat in Liberia, Tonya is what we call Commissioner of Immigration and Naturalization, which is a part of the security establishment. He had good friends uh, among the uh, British and American embassies in, in Ivory Coast. He had very good contacts.
contacts with who within those embassies? Of course, the, the officials, the ambassador, the intelligence people, he knew all of them. Intelligence people like whom? Well, I don't know the names of the individuals, but when we talk about intelligence from the United States, especially external intelligence, we're talking about what? The Central Intelligence people, uh, he did not introduce us to them because he's an intelligence officer, but he had extensive contacts with them. And was that of assistance to the NPFL? Well, I didn't, I didn't ask Tony where he got his little money from, and, uh, but he assisted with uh, little funds and, and meals, and things were just made easy for us. I remember now, uh, moving people across West Africa, uh, from Ivory Coast to Burkina Faso to Libya, there was no leakage anywhere. No one, nowhere, anywhere on this planet knew at that particular time that Charles Taylor was training people in Libya. So I must assume that those connections were used very well because we moved people throughout that region. We got travel documents for them. So Tony uh, used his links very well. Let me just pause for a moment. Dealing with the same topic, did you have a secretary when you were at the GSA, Mr. Taylor? Yes. Can you recall her name? Yes. What is it? Uh, my secretary at the General Services Agency was called uh, Grace B. Minor. Uh, it was not just secretary, it was something like an assistant directorship uh, and special assistant. Uh, Grace Beatrix Minor, who uh, later on also fled to the United States, uh, and after when I left, did she flee to the United States? At the at the time of my departure from the General Services Administration, uh, when Clarence Mamalu arrived at the GSA, he went after Grace Minor and the deputy Blamo Nelson that I said is now senator in Liberia. Uh, Blamo remained in Liberia but Grace went to the United States and uh, she uh, remained in contact with me throughout this period and was the second main link to Ellen Johnson Sirleaf that was a very very uh, very and very close buddy of uh, of, of, of Grace Minor. Now, Mr. Griffiths, two things. The spelling of Minor. M-I-N-O-R. And uh, the, the date of the French trip, when, when you, it was that you went to France. Okay, that is after I come out of jail. I'm going to have to approximate this justice. Um, <clears throat> I'm released from uh, the prison in Accra uh, in uh, late, let's say, 86, I go. So that trip to to Paris has to be somewhere in the first half of 87. Now, so that's Grace Minor. Now you've already told us that many of your, your recruits came from Liberians living in Cote d'Ivoire. Was there anyone in particular who had the main responsibility for that process of recruitment in the Cote d'Ivoire? Yes, the one, the one that uh, comes to mind is the late uh, Alfred uh, May. Uh, Alfred uh, was responsible. He's late now. Um, he's, he, he's the one that comes to mind right now. You mentioned earlier a man called Moses Dupo. That's correct. Now, who was Moses Dupo? Uh, Moses Dupo was a mutual uh, a friend of uh, mine and General Thomas Kuwakba. 
we uh, were in the states together in the Union of Liberian Associations in the Americas. I, I think I mentioned that in my testimony on yesterday. Uh, it so happened that Tupi, my wife, uh, my wife's sister was also, Tupi's sister was also married to Moses Dupo. So we were in the union together, but these are two guys that were married in the same family. So we were very close. He was very, very close to General Kuomba also, and was also in uh, La Côte d'Ivoire at the time. Now, <clears throat> You spoke of a split with Tonya King over the Libyan connection. Was Tonya King the... Excuse me, but I think that mischaracterizes what the witness said. He didn't talk about a split. He talked about Mr. King being afraid to go to Libya. Yes, sir. Very well. Okay, but I can clarify that. Well, can you help us then, yes. please, Mr. Taylor? Uh, I think Council is right. Uh, Turnian is with me all the way, but he just would not travel to Libya. He was afraid. And again, we, we are in this period uh, of, the, of the Cold War, and Libya is not the type of word that anybody wants to hear. And just to, I don't want to use the word speculate because the court does not accept that, but my own guess, I'll put it this way, is that Tonya has intelligence connections, and maybe it's good that he didn't go, because his connections with the diplomatic committee in Ivory Coast just might have exposed him, but he did not go, and so we, I got upset and, and felt that if, if we had put men together to send for training and he was not prepared to, to, to visit them, as Tom had visited them, and it's not like in Ellen who was in the United States and by coming would have uh, probably burned her track, uh, they would have gotten to know. But being right in West Africa, if he didn't go, then we had to drop him, and we dropped him. Was anybody else dropped from the original organizing group? No. Nobody else was dropped. The Moses Duopos of this world and the other people, as we advanced in this process, let, maybe I can see, I can see uh, where your questions are, are, are coming from. I, I just want to explain this. <clears throat> there were some of the individuals down there that were anxious and wanted to get people to train, they wanted to fight. They were reluctant and may I just suggest scared when it came to Libya. They would go all the way, oh my God, if, if, if the people know that we in Libya, it would be a, so some of us were prepared to do it because we believe in this whole Pan-African approach and we knew how Libya had been helping other areas like this terrible apartheid regime in South Africa that if it had not been for Gaddafi, they would probably be, still be sitting there. You understand me? And they would still be sitting in Southwest Africa that we now call Namibia. And most of these revolutionary movements, just at that particular time, Libya was something like a black snake. But some of us was prepared, I mean were prepared, because this man was genuine in trying to help the Pan-African cause. And I'm not talking terrorism. I'm talking about the Pan-African cause. So those of our friends and brothers that wanted to do something but were not prepared just had to, we just had to drop them. That included the dual pools of this world and the rest of them. King the rest of them like who? Oh, there's just so many of them in La Côte d'Ivoire. Harry Newman was down there. He didn't go along. Sam Duke was there. It's, it's a whole bunch of them. I mean, it's a whole list that were not prepared to take that extra step to get training done in Libya. Maybe okay. in any other place they would have, but Libya was a no-no. Doki, how do you spell it? Samuel Doki, D-O-K-I-E, Samuel Doki. He joined me subsequently, but uh, he was in the area. 
Does the name General Podia mean anything to you, Mr. Turner? Uh, Podia well, was Jeff, the... That's a leading question. Well, it, 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 it is leading, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Griffiths, but uh, are you asking something that's an issue, or...? Well, I was hoping it wasn't an issue, um, um, Your Honor, but um, maybe I ought to tread with care. I don't know if it's bleeding, but still. Who was Samuel Doe's vice president on the PRC? After the execution of uh, General Thomas Way Saint that we've mentioned here, uh, General Podier uh, became the vice head of state. Did he remain in that position? No, no, no. Uh, General Podier, uh, the question that you asked me earlier, uh, if I were to begin to name everybody, uh, it would be virtually impossible because everyone that was entered was out of Liberia there, including Podier. Uh, no. Podier was there. How did Podier come to be there? Well, uh, Podier had, uh, he had also uh, uh, broken away. After the elections of Samuel Doe, Podier and all of these guys were sidelined. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about the election of October 1985. Mm -hmm. They were all sidelined, and then Podia and all of these guys became disgruntled uh, and left the country and were prepared to fight to remove Doe. In what circumstances was General, did po General Podia leave Liberia? I, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't recall the exact situation. I was not in Liberia at the time, but I know that his, his life was under threat and he came out of Liberia. Now, you've told us about uh, groups of Liberians training in Ghana, in Libya. Did anything happen in relation to General Podia in any such attempt? Well, let's, let's get the sequence here right. Um, These guys, poor dear, uh, do poor, all of them remain in La Côte d'Ivoire. The men are now training, and I think uh, early to middle 1987, uh, poor dear, now so uh, impatient, may I say, foolishly, decides that he has found an African witch doctor that can make him invisible. And so he's going to become invisible, go to Liberia, enter the mansion, catch Doe, and take power. Now, it, it may sound crazy, but this is exactly what happened. He goes into Liberia, but before then, Doe begins to lure him into Liberia. Doe tells him to come back and uh, I'll make you vice president. Okay, we are not now in La Côte d'Ivoire. We're moving our people for our training in Libya. So he foolishly uh, agrees and says that well, now that he has this so-called witch doctor disappearing power, he will accept the invitation, go and catch Doe and kill him. So he goes, and as he reaches uh, Ganta, this is a town uh, in Nima County. Doe is already prepared for him. Doe arrests him and I think one other uh, a gentleman and, and kills him. That's, that's the end of the podium story. Now I want to look in more detail at the actual logistics involved in putting together the MPFL, where did the main recruitment take place? La Côte d'Ivoire. And for the most part, those recruited came from which Liberia. ethnic groups in Liberia? About 90% were members of the uh, 
Gil and Mana ethnic groups from uh, Nima County. By which route did they travel from Cote d'Ivoire to Libya? They traveled by road from Cote d'Ivoire, Ouagadougou, and then a flight to Libya. Who paid for it? Not the Libyan, uh, the Mataba, the Libyan Mataba paid for it. In what numbers did they travel from Cote d'Ivoire to Libya? They traveled in uh, small groups, 15, 20, not large groups at a time, uh, to make sure that it was just not too open to large numbers of persons that are moving. Uh, some of them will travel by buses, some will travel by train uh, into Ouagadougou. And where did they obtain the necessary travel documentation from? All of that was arranged by Tony and help with the arrangement for the, uh, the uh, travel document. Uh, Alfred May, that I mentioned before, also helped with the arrangement for the travel document. All was required uh, and this is important, ECOWAS, member states, that's the Economic Community of West African States, do not require visas for the member states. You can travel on what is called a laissez passe uh, to any of these countries. Uh, and in the case of uh, the what we call the Francophone group, and what is that? Uh, those countries in West Africa that had France as their colonial masters are the Francophone. The Anglophone are those that the British were their masters. And so in the case of the Francophone with a, an identity card, even without a passport, you could travel. So uh, what we sought to do and uh, I must admit, I do not know the full detail yet because, don't forget, I'm in jail in Ghana when the first two groups move. But after I get out, this is what I meet. They get laser passes from uh, using Tunians contact, some from the Liberian embassy. And some of these guys, well, let me move that, that word, guys, some of these men, are uh, uh, guilds. Now, <clears throat> the guild ethnic group is a very large ethnic group that you find in La Côte d'Ivoire and in Liberia. They speak the uh, same language. In La Côte d'Ivoire, they would throw one or two French words, but a guild from La Côte d'Ivoire and a guild from Liberia, you would know the difference because when they meet, they speak guild. This is also true for the Manos, and as we progress, this is also true when it comes to the Sierra Leone side of the border. So the guilds from Liberia that spoke guild went to the gendarmerie and speaking Gil, they were able to get identity cards. Now, that's why I went through this whole thing to explain to you. So, uh, to become an Ivorian for the Gils, all you had to do, once you spoke the language, you went to the Ivorian uh, gendarme office in Danane, which is a town, I think that's D-A-N-A-N-E, -A -A -E, and that's in the records or a ma, M-A-N, uh, 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 a little bigger town outside of Danane. Once you got there and you spoke Gil and said that you were coming from, let's say, a border town with Liberia, uh, you were, you know, an Ivorian and you got a carte d'identité. So they could also use that to travel to Burkina Faso. <clears throat> because the, the, the carte d'identité uh, they have, they had during that particular period, and I think to a great extent it still is this, you've got this, um, I think is something is entente. The... Something what? 
it's, it's called Entente. I think it's a French word, Entente. It, As in Entente Cordiale. Ah, voila, voila, that's it. Uh, this is an English speaking court, by the way, Mr. Turner. Yeah, well, well you said uh, as in Cordial. Um, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, Benin, and I want to believe, uh, to a greater extent, Senegal. Uh, there was a time that ministers. Uh, I mean, individuals from those countries became French ministers. So that that whole cooperation existed. So using an identity card between these countries was very, very simple because uh, they they exchanged silver sevens. If uh, if you were very good and you were, say, for example, uh, Ivorian, uh, you could become a minister in Burkina Faso. I mean, a minister in government. Uh, this is that type of cordiality that was amongst these states. So. That's why it was so easy for the carte d'identité to be used uh, between and amongst them. And help me with, help us with this. What was the criteria for recruitment of uh, men into the MPFO? First, you had to be of age. You you had to be of uh, 18, which is the legal age in Liberia for men. I guess you had to be mad enough to want to fight. You had to be physical, but I mean, if you were not serious enough, I mean, there were sufficient angry people. You had to be angry enough to want to fight. Physically fit and of age, and, and you went in. Now, let's move to Libya then, and I wonder if now I can be assisted with Defense Document 208. Now, Mr. Taylor, we have here a map of Libya. And can you see on that map Tarabulus, Tripoli? Yes, I can. Now, the camp to which these men were taken was in what location? Uh, I did say that the men were taken to a town uh, outside of Tripoli called Tajura. How do you spell that? Uh, that is T-R-H-U-R-A-H. Now, if we look at another map which looks like this, We see Tarabolus and we also see highlighted Tajura. Yes? Yes. Now, first of all, Mr. Turk, mm -hmm. just physically, what was this camp like at Tajura? Tajura is a very, very huge uh, former United States military base uh, that was built in Libya uh, before the, uh, the revolution of uh, Conor Gaddafi. It's an extraordinarily huge military base that was U.S. owned uh, but had been vacated at the time of the revolution. <clears throat> When was the first time that you went to Tajura? Following my release from jail, I visit uh, Libya again. 
And then uh, the men are now in the camp. I go to the camp to visit them because they had not seen me. I had been in jail for eight months. They had not seen me. I was just about to take them. They are now on the base. And so I went there to, uh, you know, to greet them and to you know, tell them uh, thanks for what they were doing. Pause uh, there. Because they had not seen me. Pause there. How many men are we talking about? The first two groups are already there. They are continuing. The movement is continuing. I get out. I've gone through this process. I go to, uh, I have now gone to France. I have informed Ellen. I come back. I go to Libya now to go and visit with the men. By this time, the first two groups of men that have traveled, all I have seen of them myself are the photos. I have not physically met them yet. Even by the time I show those photos to, to Ellen, I have not met them yet. Mm. But my question, to go back to it, Mr. Taylor, was how many men are in the camp at that stage? They are about 40, 40, 45 men at that stage. Mm. In due course, what was the maximum number of men that you had at Tajura. In due course, the total number of men uh, finally reached about 168, I would say. Around about 168. Now, I want to go through this part in some detail, Mr. Taylor, because you appreciated, suggested that the plan to terrorize the people of Sierra Leone was hatched in Libya. You appreciate that, don't you? Yes, I do. So, <clears throat> taking things slowly and in stages, firstly, what was the Libya to which these recruits were sent? You say, what was Libya? Yeah, what was it like? Well, we, we are now dealing with a Libya that is championing Pan-African activities. That is helping out across the continent uh, those peoples that believed in the Pan-African approach and those that were interested in uh, democratic governance. And let me make it very clear. Uh, when I got to Libya, that Libya that I met was anti-communist. In fact, Libya has never endorsed or embraced communism. It was never then and now. They were helping out in terms of training. They were seriously involved in trying to free uh, the rest of Africa. And that's why I think that Gaddafi, uh, whether people like it or not, is an African hero. Uh, by helping people to, 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 to stand up against some of the terrible, filthy things that were going on on the African continent, under the guise of the, 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 their colonial rule, even though it was new at the time, new colonialism in different shapes and form, he was the only one that had the backbone to, to uh, stand up to them, and that's the Libya that I met. I met a pan-African Libya, I met a Libya willing and able to help, and did help almost every major functioning government of any revolutionary credentials from East, Central, to Southern, and West Africa, they owe it to the Libyan people. Now, you mentioned before the luncheon adjournment, Mataba. That is correct. Now, explain to us, what was Mataba? Uh, the Mataba <clears throat> was uh, an organization set up specifically 
to support pan-African revolutionary activities in Africa and I would hope, I, I would believe, I, I would it, but I want to deal with Africa, in Africa, that I am positive about. And I want you to help us. Is Matabra an organization? And if so, how is it composed? Help us, please. Good. Members, <clears throat> the Mataba is not just Libyans. Individuals with revolutionary uh, zeal, uh, those that were interested in fighting this new colonial situation across Africa, you became a member. If you are a leader, you became a member of that organization. So the Mataba was not just Libyans, but the Mataba was those Libyans that were there to help, but they were mostly the organizations across Africa that needed the help comprised the membership. Right. Now, just give us the names of some of the organizations from around Africa which was part of that Mataba, please. The ANC, full member, SWAPO. Where was SWAPO upon? Remind us, not everyone is 61 <laughs> okay. years old, Mr. Taylor. I'm, I'm sorry for being so old. And uh, also, if we could have the full names rather than this, the, the, uh, the, the acronyms. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, the ANC is the African National Congress that is now in power in South Africa. SWAPO. Uh, was the uh, the Southern African uh, political organization under the the I, the? I can't see that there's any dispute about this. It's actually the Southwest uh, Southwest African Southwest peoples. African People's uh, Swapo uh, that was lead, headed uh, then by uh, our good friend Sam and Juma. Uh, you also had the Ghanaian uh, revolution that was headed by Jerry Rollins. They were a member too? Of course. Who else? You had Burkina Faso. Uh, they were members of the Mataba. You had Uganda was a member of the Mataba. What was that organization called or did it have a name? No, no, no. I, uh, Uganda went there. Uh, this is the time of, uh, uh, we're talking all the way back 86, uh, 87. At that particular time, they did not go there as an organization. My good friend in Uganda was going through his own problems, but they had representatives. Who's he? I'm talking about the person president, Museveni. Museveni. So he was there as well, was he? No, not he personally, he had a representative there. Okay, and what was that representative's name? Do you know? If you don't, tell us. I, I, I don't quite uh, uh, recollect. Uh, I, I will see if I can go through my head, but there was a representative there. Um, do you know someone by the name of Ember Bazi? Objection. That is leading. He's what do you say, Mr. Gouvis? Well, Mr. President, I understand that leading questions are not disallowed where you're dealing with non-contentious issues. If it is contentious, then of course I will act with more care. But normally I understand that where you're not dealing with matters in dispute, then there's no objection to leading. But I stand corrected if a different rule applies. That, Is was it not in the, dispute, uh, that was not the position taken during the prosecution case in chief, and we don't know if it's in dispute because we don't know what they want to use it for, and we have no idea who the representative was. So it's not a matter that is of common knowledge. All right. Well, you, you can renew your objection uh, if it turns out it is in dispute. Uh, mm. I'll allow the question. Go ahead. Very well. Do you know that name, Mr. Taylor? I know him Babazi very well. And who was he? He was a representative uh, that went in and out from Uganda. 
And some spellings, Sam and Joma, N-U-J-O-M-A. Um, Museveni, Yoweri, Y-O-W-E-R-I, Museveni, M-U-S-E-V-E-N-I. And Amama, M Babazi, A-M-A-M-A, M-B-A, B-A-Z-I. Mbabazi, Mbabazi. Yes. Now, so far you've mentioned various groups from around Africa, Mr. Taylor. Were there groups there from other, any other part of the world? The, yes, we, we met a group, uh, some of them I really <coughs> I cannot uh, recall uh, the, their own uh, affiliations uh, at this particular time, but there were groups from other part of the world. Help us, what parts of the world? There were groups from Europe. There were groups Such from, as, what parts of Europe? Uh, the United Kingdom, there were uh, groups from... Uh, uh, Where in the, the United Kingdom? Well, uh, there were Irish groups there from uh, the IRA. There were IRA representatives. I don't know uh, because most of these uh, individuals, we have to be lucky to know their names. But there were groups from different parts that I don't recall some of their names from uh, the uh, the uh, Southern Hemisphere. Uh, uh, Sumatra and I, don't, I forgot what area that is. Uh, Sumatra, they were they were representatives from the island states, uh, from all over. So, how many people were? Give us an idea. How many people were actually a part of the Mataba? How many people are we talking about? Well, uh, in terms of individuals, I, I don't know the number. But in terms of organizations, there could have been as many as twenty-five. Uh, different groupings and organizations that comprise the Mataba. Now, what did the Mataba actually do as an organization? How did it manifest itself? The Mataba provided funds, provided means of training, provided what I would call an enabling a, 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 a situation for those that were yearning for change and help. But within that, what you wanted and how you wanted it was a part of a collective discussion. So for example, uh, let's say I'm at the Mataba and some of the people that we met, I forgot to mention other groups that were there, were the, the, the Gambian group was there. So I reached to the Mataba and at any given meeting, for example, some of the meetings that I sat in, you have, there were several unions, there was a several union, there was a Gambian, there was a Ghanaian, there was a Burkinabe, there could be a South African, but you would sit, you sit down, discuss your problems, and what possibly had to be done to assist you, what type of assistance. Libyans will sit in the meeting and based on your own personal uh, uh, desires, the Libyans will come in and help you to achieve that. But you, you, you had to go through a process, what we call then establishing your, revolu I mean your revolutionary, excuse me, credentials. So no, no, no flukies went to sit at that Mataba uh, to to talk about revolution, you had to be practically vetted. You had to know what you were talking about. And what do I mean by fluky? You could not just go to Libya and say, "Hey, I want to launch a revolution and become a member of the Mataba." You had to show that you had the capacity. And if you wanted to stage, uh, let's say, uh, an armed struggle, you had to show that you had the, the the manpower to accomplish it, and that you were willing to be disciplined. Because, you know, and, and, and respect uh, 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 laws of war, we had to go through all of this at the Mataba. So, for example, those people that I associated with during the time I was there 
Well, the Sierra Union leader, Ali Kaba, the Gambian leader, doc, I mean, Dr. Manny, M-A-N-N-E-H, uh, Kukuya Samba Sanye is his real name. We're going to have to get the thing for that. Uh, the Burkina B uh, uh, people, I mean, uh, uh, not people, uh, the Burkina B representative that was there. And so we'll go through this discussion and determine if or what you tell your problem and see how we could converge together. So the Mataba must not be looked at as though it was uh, an organization on its own. The Mataba was an organization within itself comprising individuals that wanted to stage uh, Pan-African activities on the continent. I need to press you for f more information on this, Mr. Taylor. So you've explained the composition of the group. You've explained how you needed to establish your revolutionary credentials. Was there an overarching philosophy at the Mataba? You know, I, 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 I've always not gone into uh, these uh, these political philosophies. The Mataba did not press anyone to adopt a Libyan style government or movement. The Mataba was about assisting in the overall philosophy of pan Africanism, where Africans would want to take control of their own continent, and I mean real control. That's the principal philosophy that mm -hmm. we met there. For example, we appreciate the link between Colonel Gaddafi and the Little Green Book. Was that required reading for everyone at the Mataba? Yes, you, you were required to at least read it, but you were not required to adopt it as a philosophy or else. So was there an all-encompassing philosophy at the Mataba? which had, for example, a Marxist-Leninist base. Gaddafi would have never permitted anyone to stay in Libya if you had a Marxist-Leninist communist base. I said before in my testimony, he was and is not communist. So, it had to do with Pan-African approach as far as a political philosophy was concerned uh, Gaddafi is a socialist as far as the economic ideas are concerned. Okay, so, no, 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 he, he was not that, uh, that Marxist, that, no, no, Marxism, no, 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 no. Give us an idea of the total number of people who were at that camp at Tajura. I don't know. What are we talking about, Mr. Taylor? Can you give us some kind of idea? Well, let me tell you what I mean. In total. No, I, I don't know. I, I, I'll put it this way. The leaders of the groupings in Libya did not stay in the camps. They visited their men in the camps. In the camps, they, all groupings that went, the camp, Tajira is so huge it probably could train 10, 15, 20,000 people at a time. But I would be misleading to say that I can approximate the number of people that were in there. But what I do know, when I arrived in Libya with my men, the several union group was already in Libya. The Gambian group was already in Libya. The first Liberian group taken by Dr. Famle was already in Libya. Now, I did not even know how many Liberians were in that first group because you are not concerned and you are not permitted to associate with other groups. The only thing you knew, you knew that groups were there because you met their leaders almost on a daily basis, not in the camp, but in Tripoli at the Mataba. Now, why I'm asking you about numbers is I want to get an idea of how easy it would be to know, for example, all the members 
who were there from South Africa who were training. All the members from Gambia were training. That's why I'm asking. So, did you have any idea about that? No. Uh, <clears throat> I, I hope this explanation will help the court. You're talking about a, a very, very huge military base that I think, and I stand corrected on this, maybe the records will show, may have been the largest U.S. base in Libya at the time. So United States bases are not small bases. They are humongous. Now, there were large groups because their leaders uh, uh, were, you know, were, uh, they're considered to be, you know, extraordinary. The Liberian group that I carry may have been one of the, the smallest group. The point I'm trying to make here is that that base was capable of training at any one time 10, 15, 20,000 people. And there were times that uh, you could have had as many. And I, and, and I don't want questions to come up later where you said that there were 10,000 or 15,000 people. There were probably more people. Because when you think about some of the groups that went there for training, some people carried thousands of people. But the point I want to drive home here is that you would very rarely be able to put your finger on exact amounts because no matter how small or how large the group was, it was not your business. You did not have contact with the groups. You only had contacts with the leaders. Were you ever permanently based at the camp in Libya, Mr. Taylor? Never. I just said that... Uh, I never lived at the camp. No leader in Libya that was a member of the Mataba lived at the military barracks at Tajura. You had an apartment in Tripoli. There was a guest house for those of us that went in and came out that stayed at the guest house in Libya or at a hotel in Tripoli. But you never ever stayed in the camp. You could go and visit your men for several hours, sit around, talk with them, which was encouraged because you don't want to just carry people to a military camp, drop them, they never hear from you again when you just come back and say, hey, guess what, we're ready to take you. So you could go, which was a good idea, and it showed good leadership skills to go and sit with your men. Now, it must be important to note this. The men within the camp did associate with each other. So, for example, uh, people from, I would say, the African continent, most of the men that trained, a lot of them knew each other very well because they were in the same camp. And sometimes, uh, let's say, uh, my men, for example, 168 men did not comprise, uh, that's just about, I would say, probably a company size, militarily. Uh, one company and so uh, that's so if they wanted to say train a battalion size uh, maybe four five hundred men they would put groups together uh, but that is for the training of the men in the camp uh, but they would not permit leaders to go there to go and, and meddle with other people or get to know who was there that was not your business the men knew each other, but the leaders knew each other. Were the leaders in Tripoli based in the same guest house? Uh, some were in the guest house. Uh, some of, I mean, were in the hotels. Uh, Ali Kaba, uh, Kukuya Samba Sanye, myself, uh, most of the West Africans uh, that did not really stay there a whole lot uh, used the Mataba guest house. I had. Uh, there was an apartment in Tripoli that I used, okay, but uh, most of them, uh, and I came to Mataba every day, and as, as is normal, and I'm sure the judges will understand it. You're from West Africa, of course you want to hang with West Africans. So at the Mataba, most times, uh, Dr. Manny, Ali Kaba, myself will be together, uh, you know, conversing all of the time, when I was there. So, what about Fode Sanko? Fode Sanko was, I tell you, what I heard of Fode Sanko for the first time on the BBC. Fode Sanko was nothing. 
he was not at the Mataba, for the Sanko was apparently one of Ali Kaba's men that were in the camp. For the Sanko knew my men. I did not know For the Sanko, just as Ali Kaba did not know my men. No, For the Sanko was nowhere with the type of credentials to be a member of the Mataba. Because if he had to be a member of the Mataba, then it meant that Ali Kaba would not be there. And it was Ali Kaba there. And Ali Kaba, that surname Kaba, who is he related to? Well, I'm going to tell you what Ali told me. Ali Kaba told me that he was, he had been a student, a Pan-African uh, student uh, activist at Frabe College in, in Sierra Leone. There were problems at Frabe. I think he got in trouble once or twice. Either got thrown out. Uh, his, and, and, and I want to be sure of this, uh, because again, uh, in Africa when you say uncle, father, brother, you have to be very careful. But Tijeni, Tijeni Kaba, former president Tijeni Kaba, Ali told me upon his retirement from the United Nations, where Tijeni, I think, had risen to the rank of Under Secretary General, had retired. With, he sought to move Ali from Sierra Leone. Who sought to move Ali? I'm saying Tijeni, Tijeni Kaba. Move Ali from Sierra Leone because of the problems he was experiencing and some and a few other individuals from Farabe into Ghana and on to Libya where this whole pan-African thing was going on and that's what I know about him that Ali told me that Tijeni is his uncle now I could be asked about this and I don't know whether it's an African uncle or a biological uncle because in Africa when we say uncle it could mean an older man or whatever but that's how he got there and Tijeni knew he was there that's what Ali told me I met him there I met that group there can I pause for a moment and deal with some spellings please Dr. Mane M-A-N-N-E-H whose name is also Kukwai Samba Sanyang K-U-K-O-I, new word, Samba, S-A-M-B-A, -A, new word, S-A-N-Y-A-N-G, Burkinabe, B-U-R-K-I-N-A-B-E. -E. Is there anything else with which I can assist at this stage, Mr. President? Uh, thanks, Mr. Grievous. I can't think of anything at the moment. Mm. <clears throat> now... What kind of training did you want for your men at Tajura, Mr. Taylor? My, my own revolution, uh, as we planned, was based on one principal strategy. That my men would be uh, trained uh, in uh, military discipline. And that they would be well trained and that these men would then stand as the eyes and ears of the revolution that was actually to be launched by the Liberian people. By that I mean going back into Nimba. And so they did uh, military training and I think my men probably stayed in Libya uh, longer than almost any group. As a matter of fact, uh, because uh, I do not know exactly when the Sierra Union group got there, but I remember the Sierra Union group left uh, Libya uh, before my group. I do not know where they went to, but I lost sight of Ali as, as of that time. Let's unpack that a little further, please. <laughs> Firstly, when did your men first arrive in Libya? Uh, the men, remember I mentioned I was still in jail. The men started arriving in Libya in the uh, uh, early, what that would be, a... Eh?
87 that had to be early 87 they started arriving in uh, Libya and when did they leave oh my men did not leave Libya until the around the middle of 89 two almost two full years of military training now during that two-year period help us how much time did you spend in Tajura? None. A day, several hours at a time whenever I was there. I just mentioned for the record, I and no other leader lived in Tajura. We could not. How regularly would you visit then? I, uh, during that period, uh, would probably visit uh, Libya, probably once every three or four months and when I did not go Tom who were you would go visit with the men because I was uh, busy trying to plan uh, what on what the men would do uh, when they returned from Libya now for the the not to confuse anyone you have 168 men in Libya that have been trained. But Libya is a far away from Liberia. So how are you going to get these men back from Libya and more particularly get them into Liberia was what I was involved with moving in the West African subregion in trying to put that end of it together. So by the time the men actually were ready that there will be uh, an available country to, uh, to take them, one with close proximity to Liberia that they will be able to enter. That was my job. So I did not run up and down on that at, at that particular place. So where were you based during that period? Burkina Faso. Where in Burkina Faso? Bagadougou, the capital. I had a house there. Were you living in that house by yourself? No, no, no. I was living there with Agnes. And where's Tupi at this time? Ah, Tupi and I, I mean, we, we, are, we are separated. And she's, but where was she's, she living? She's in the United States. Now... You've told us that you were aware that there were Sierra Leoneans in the camp at Tajura. That is correct. Do you know when they'd arrived there? Not particularly, no. Um, I just knew that they were there. Ali was there. He told me that his men were in the camp. Did you know how many Sierra Leoneans were there? No, I did not. And, you that mentioned? Is not, and that is not odd because I did not even know how many other Liberians were there. I don't follow that. I'm sorry. Well, I'm trying to say it is not odd that I would not know how many Sierra Leoneans were there because it was nobody's business. I, I did not even know how many other Liberians. Remember, I mentioned to the court that Dr. Famula had men in the camp. I didn't even know how many men he had in the camp, even though they were Liberians. What about Gambians? Did you have any idea how many Gambians were there? Yes, because the Gambians were not in the camps. The, the Gambians had, uh, before we got to Libya, had attempted an uprising in the Gambia, led by Kukuya Samasanya, about a year or maybe earlier, and had fled the Gambia. So they were already trained soldiers. They were not more than, I would say, 25. I know this because uh, the Gambians uh, were used as security personnel at the Mataba facilities. Okay, so they were not trainees anymore. They, they had already, they were like revolutionaries, had already attempted a revolution, had failed, and they were all there. Their leader was there. So uh, we got to know most of the boys because they were outside at the gates. They were the security personnel at the Mataba. Now, you've told us about meeting with Ali Kaba 
Dr. Mane. Concentrating on those two for the moment, did you come to any mutual agreement with them to assist each other in your revolution? Not at all. We were there looking for assistance ourselves. So how could we assist anybody? No, no one was looking for assistance. Uh, in my case, no. In Ali's case, no. Uh, in Manning's case, no. Because in fact, we were there and all the assistance that we needed, we were getting it uh, through our Mataba colleagues. Maybe you misunderstand me, Mr. Turner. Did you say, for example, to Ali Kaba, when I launch my revolution, I want you to help me? Never. No. That is, no. That is leading the witness. It would be much better if the witness would testify. Well, I've had it. Look, it's very clear. I did not seek any assistance from Ali Kaba. Ali Kaba did not seek any assistance. Did not seek any assistance from me. I said Manny did not seek any assistance from me or Ali Kaba, and vice versa. We were not in a mataba to 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 ask to assist each other in what they wanted to do. We were there to exchange Pan-African jargons and talk about it, but at no time, at no time. Did I promise Ali Kaba or he promised me at no time did I request from Ali Kaba any assistance or at no time did Ali Kaba ask of any or for any assistance from me? At no time. Because Ali Kaba's own revolution, as far as he had explained it to me, Ali Kaba, who by the way, if it were possible, we'll still bring him to this court because I think he's available, he's just frightened. Ali Kaba said to me that within the armed forces of Sierra Leone and the police and the other security apparatus, he had all of the assistance that he needed and that the men he was training in Libya would return directly to Sierra Leone and that upon the return from inside Sierra Leone, they will launch the revolution. So there was no request or no nothing from him to me or from me to him. It was not necessary. It did not happen. There were no promises and could have never been. Another aspect of this, and you appreciate why I'm asking you about in such detail about this, Mr. Taylor. Yes, I do. You've already explained that your men were receiving military training. Now, apart from military training, was there any kind of ideological or philosoph philosophical training? No. My men did not receive any ideological or philosophical training. At Tajura, the men, I was aware of the fact that all, I may I say most of the people there, were given an opportunity to read the Green Book. But the Green Book was not a prerequisite for assistance. So we did not, we were not subjected to ideological or psychological training at all. We were there for our own revolution to launch it our way. We were given an opportunity to read the Green Book. If we wanted anything, fine. I did not subscribe to everything that was a part of the Green Book. So my people were not ideologically trained with the Green Book, no. But help us, Mr. Taylor, on those occasions when you visited the camp, did you address the men as a collective? Collectively. Oh, yes. Are my men? Now help my, us. My men. Yes. Now help us. What did you say to them as to why they're there, what your intention is, what you're seeking to achieve? What did you tell them? Well, very simple. Uh, don't let's forget Liberia was not in the, 
in the dark at the time of his people and these men that were there uh, they were not of the caliber of the people's redemption council we had educated people uh, for example I told you where you went there we talked about this change of moving dough we talked about the type of government that we wanted to set up that would be free of tribalism sectionalism and all this kind of stuff uh, we talked about uh, eliminating well, this well I'm not interested in all this kind of stuff that's what we talked about I want you to spell it out please it is suggested that you form the plan there to terrorize the civilian population. So take your time, Mr. Taylor, and tell us what was the plan. The whole purpose, the whole purpose for the two years that we spent in Libya was to make sure that people were trained as military people and trained in the laws of war we realize, and I have made it very clear to this court, the 168 men that we trained, we were basically depending on the civilian population in Liberia to launch the revolution. Now, it would be silly and really stupid for anyone wanting to launch a revolution using civilians to want to terrorize them. They, we were too small a number to go and fight a war. So we needed the people. So principally we dealt with. We dealt with how to act with civilians, how to behave, and what to do. Well, you do not harass people. You do not take their goats, their chickens. You do not rape. You do not loot. And where, even during the crisis, where it happened, we acted. So we dealt directly with organizing our people to first of all care for any revolutionary leader, any guerrilla leader must know that unless you take good care of the civilians, you will go no place. And so primarily, we considered our attitude toward the civilian population as paramount to being successful in our revolution. And because we did, we were successful. So what did you say to them about the type of government you wanted to establish in Liberia? It was going to be a democratic government. We wanted to go in, uh, launch the revolution, and submit ourselves to free and fair elections. And help us, because again, this is relevant. What was the military philosophy taught at the camp? Well, when you talk about philosophy, I'm going to need some help from the court. Uh, in terms of military philosophy, there could be quite a few, but uh, maybe I'll get some assistance from the court on this. Uh, what do mm -hmm. you mean by military philosophy? Well, how were your soldiers taught, or were they taught to as to how to wage their guerrilla war, what tactics to adopt? Well, okay, I, I'm not sure if we're talking philosophy or, or, or military strategy. Uh, as far as, I, I, I thought I had dealt with this, but... Well, all right. Well, uh, I'll, I'll go back through it. There was an overall strategy, and again, uh, 168 men done launch a war in a country. We sought to have our men well trained and disciplined and well, basically in military you have discipline and courtesy to make sure that we could go in sufficiently work with the local population once we had launched the revolution where the local population would come in and help we did not have to coerce them. We did not have to subject them to any abuse. And that through that process, our numbers will rise. They will be trained, basically, and we will be successful in our revolution. That is basically the overall strategy that we designed. Well, I'm sorry for laboring this, but it's so important, I fear I must. 
What was the philosophy regarding the treatment of civilians? You know, I guess we, 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 you know, go in this and that, but I, I, I will just answer you. Uh, I said earlier, if you, if you abuse any civilians, uh, if you took their property away from them, if you, if you, if you, if you took their homes from them, you will lose their support. What we said that military people would deal with military people but civilians will deal with civilians and this is why even as we enter Liberia we did not dismantle the civilian apparatus that we met on the ground we took advantage of uh, our chiefs our elders our zoos to work along with the population they our were what? told zoos <laughs> Zo well yeah zoos Z -O -E -S. Our, our zoos are our traditional native people uh, that anything involving civilians should be referred to the civilian administration. Anything military will be dealt uh, with uh, the military. That is why uh, in my testimony, I think yesterday, I mentioned very clearly that we accept that those military people that carried out atrocities were arrested they were court-martialed under the Uniform Court of Military Justice, and they were dealt with. And that is why there is not one instance that have been presented before this court where there was a civilian that was executed uh, by the military command of the MPFL. It is because of the separation that we did. We separated military activities from civilian activities and left the civilian activities to the civilian administration in the country. Let me break it down further. What was said about the treatment of children? We did not at all encourage any children under the age of 17 to be involved in military activities. We did not, in fact, we did not close the schools. Now, this is one thing that has not no, come no, up. No, no, Mr. Taylor. I'm talking about Libya, where the plan is supposed to start. What was taught about how children should be treated? Well, well just... Are you there, Mr. Interpreter? What, what's happening? Feedback. I'm on channel one. So put your hand. Put your hand set on the other No, I don't want to hear it. I think uh, I think it's being it's uh, adjusted. The court managers inquiring as to which channel has been switched. Your Honour, the AV booth is liaising with the interpretation to find out what could have transpired. Well, well, in the meantime, can we continue without interruption? Have they adjusted whatever they were doing wrong? Your Honor, they're checking. Um, I'll give them a call back to find out. We'll go ahead and uh, let's just hope it doesn't happen again, Mr. Gervis. Very well. Well, uh, in answer to your question, no child <coughs> was to be recruited or used or trained for military activities. That's the order as regards children. Only people of military age, men and women, were to be uh, 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 received for military training. Now, what did the actual military training consist of, Mr. Taylor? Basic drills, uh, learning how to uh, uh, to uh, what you call conceal yourself in combat. Uh, they learn how to assemble, well first disassemble and assemble uh, uh, raffles. They learn how to take position to, uh, to shoot. Uh, they learn uh, military formation. 
they learn how to carry out search uh, procedures, they learned how to carry out cordon procedures, they learn, uh, and we were very specific about this, they learn how to also individually care for uh, prisoners of war. Uh, they learn how to deal with prisoners of war. And even those that were trained also learn a part of their military training how to deal with civilian populations. This was the entire course. And with all uh, the training... Mr. Givers, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No there, problem. There was just one part of that uh, piece of evidence I, I didn't understand, and that was the reference to, was it cordon procedures? Yes, uh, cordon. Uh, what, what cordon procedure is, uh, Your Honor? Uh, if the military went into an area to search it, they would secure the area before searching. It's, uh, it's called cord I think cordon. That's how I know it, cordon. No, I, I understand now. Yes. Thank you. And uh, was all of this training land-based? In Liberia? In Libya? In Libya. No, 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 no. We did uh, both land and we did uh, 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 seaborne operations. Any others? Uh, these were basically land and sea-based operations. And I don't recall any other right now. And what did the sea-based operations involve? Oh, learning how to, uh, uh, we call them Navy commandos, how to use uh, small boats to uh, navigate secretly into, into enemy territory, uh, using the sea. Uh, there were uh, a few that specialized in carrying out diving activities. For example, uh, uh, you could dive and, and go into, into areas, and we did this because Liberia has one of the longest coastlines in West Africa. And so uh, uh, how do you get from one point if we had to use the sea, uh, these Navy personnel uh, could use it. Because for us, they are sighting uh, and when I talk about boat, I'm not just, let me just, uh, maybe there's another name for it. Uh, it is boat too, but there are certain uh, 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 trees in Liberia uh, that we use for what we call uh, a canoe. Uh, it's, a, it's a very light wood that you cut and you can dig it out, hollow it out and use it. And we knew that this existed, so even if we, if, we, if we did not have the Western build little boats, we could almost use our canoe, okay, to do it. So we, we got that and trained Navy personnel, and most importantly, to swim. How to swim, rest, and don't ask me, I don't know how it's done, but they were trained to do it. You can swim in the water, rest in the water. Now that's almost impossible for me. Rest in the water and continue swimming. And so, uh, if we had to get to certain areas on a Liberian coast, uh, otherwise we needed people that were trained that could do that. So we did the seaborne training. Now, was Tajura a terrorist training camp, Mr. Taylor? <coughs> Uh, Tajura was never and is never a terrorist training camp. And in fact, if it had been, I think the United States would have destroyed it. Uh, because we were still in, in Libya when uh, the, uh, the, I think the Reagan administration, uh, if I'm not mistaken, ordered the, uh, the bombing of Tripoli. So you were there at the time? My men were there. Uh, during that uh, raid on, on Tripoli, and I am just surmising here that if they felt, and the, the buildings that were bombed were in Tripoli, that if Reagan, who, who ordered the bombing of Tripoli, thought in his mind that, that Tajura was a terrorist base, they would have bombed it. I want to move on now, please. You earlier mentioned that there were three principal personalities behind the organization of the NPF film. That is correct. 
Did anyone eventually emerge as an undisputed leader? Yes, I did. By what process did that occur? Well, uh, <clears throat> during the, the training, uh, in fact, an, an important arrangement came up. That decision was actually made by the men that had been taken uh, to uh, do the training. Now, let me, let me explain this. I'm affected, yes, but the individuals from Nimba, the Nimbadians, the, the Da and Ma uh, individuals that comprised 90% of the of the uh, the personnel in training uh, see this also as their revolution and an opportunity to go back and avenge the death of their people. In fact, what what these people in Nima at the time were actually looking for, they were really looking for a leader, somebody that could put a program together for them to go back and fight though. I mean, this is what, this was it. And so we came up with an arrangement. We sat and the arrangement was this. Okay, Mr. Taylor, you have gone through all of this headache. You've helped to put this whole thing together. The arrangement is this. We get back to Liberia, God willing, we succeed. You are the leader. But one of us must be your vice president. So in direct answer to your question, that decision was taken by the men that were taken for training. That was their decision. And when was that decision made? That decision was made in training in, uh, in 1988, before we left to come to Liberia, or West Africa at least. Now, this training was going on for some two years. Did it go totally undetected to your knowledge? To the best of my knowledge, it went undetected. I, no one knew. Well, when you say no one, I can't say absolutely no one. But I think those people that matter, and, and I'm speaking about uh, Doe, surely did not know because he never accused, he never accused Libya at the time. Uh, we did not get this feedback from any major Western intelligence source. And so uh, I can't say no one. But I think those that it would have mattered for uh, did not really get to know. Moving on. Does there come a time, Mr. Taylor, when it's decided that training has come to an end and your forces must be moved on yes and this is the hard part that i explained earlier uh, that i had been in and out because i had to put certain programs together i had come uh, to uh, west africa there was no problem in the men coming to burkina faso they left from burkina faso uh, but the problem was at what point do they enter Liberia to launch the revolution? So uh, they surely could not uh, probably do it from La Côte d'Ivoire because there were just too many people. So we did not think about La Côte d'Ivoire initially. That left one option, going back to our old friends uh, uh, in Sierra Leone. I uh, travel, and as I recall now, and I'm glad that I probably mentioned it earlier, Your Honours, uh, actually, the Kurungpa situation was with uh, Siaka Stevens. Uh, because now, I think Momo is chief of staff at the time. I will now go and Momo is president by late, 80, by 89. I then go to Momo and the contacts uh, with Momo, uh, sadly, there was a, a gentleman, he's late now, called Prince Barclay 
who B A R C L A Y, who was part Liberian and part Sierra Leonean, that knew uh, Mohammed Dumuya very well. So arrangements were made for through Dumunya uh, to see if I could come down to Sierra Leone to speak to uh, Joseph Momo. Those arrangements were uh, concluded. And so I flew into uh, Freetown. I uh, meet with uh, Dumuya, and uh, he introduces me to a very uh, nice gentleman that is dead now, uh, who was a personal, trusted friend of General Mamo. Who is that person? Uh, the gentleman is, uh, I want to know his last name because we call him, he was a brigadier, Torunkai, a very shortish man, very good, uh, nice guy, Brigadier Torunkai, who was a deputy chief of staff then of the Sierra Leone Armed Forces. Pause. Any chance of a spelling, Mr. Taylor? Torunkai. Maybe we could ask your colleagues on the opposite side to help us. Mr. Mohammed, he should know uh, it's a Sierra Leone name. Torunkai. It could be T-O-R-E-N-K-A-I. -E I'm not too sure. I'm sorry, honest. Uh, but it's Torunkai. But I'm not going to be the one to ask them. I, I think we'll, we'll continue, uh, Mr. Grivis, and uh, the, okay. the name may come up again. Uh, Brigadier Tarankai shot, nice gentleman, met with me, and he went on to President Momo and, and uh, explained to him that I had arrived, and that night I was taken to uh, President Momo. Now, pause for a moment, Mr. Taylor. Can you help us with a date here? Oh, boy. <clears throat> this... This, I would say, was uh, uh, in the, oh, this had to be in 89, I would say about the first quarter of 89, about the, uh, uh, don't hold me on this, but it was about the, 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 the first quarter of 89, and I was really struggling trying to get this thing going. Now, Torankai was not the chief of staff of the armed forces. The chief of staff at the, of the armed forces was uh, Major General, I just remember the last name, Terawale. I remember that very well. But Momo did not trust Terawale, so he trusted this operation with Torankai and said to me specifically that he didn't want Terawale to know anything about this. And so uh, in that meeting were President Momo, Brigadier Tarunkai and myself met. We had discussions. Momo remembered as Deputy Chief of, um, as Chief of Staff, the first operation. Which operation is that? That's the operation that I mentioned that involved uh, General Tamon Skurumpa. Uh, but he had some concerns. Uh, Momo said to me, he said, look, the first attack out of here that Kuwampai went with did not succeed. And though almost retaliated by trying to overrun this country. I have to be absolutely sure, one, that you have the manpower to carry out the operation successfully, and two, that you have the equipment, the equipment to do it. I showed him on both counts that we had the manpower and we had the equipment to do the job. Pause. Did you have the equipment? We had been promised the equipment uh, uh, from Libya at the time. Uh, but uh, when I told Mamo, he balked again. Uh, his second concern was, this quantity of equipment, if it came here, what if it got into the hands of the Sierra Leone Army, they probably moved me. So we were busy talking about this, and uh, he decided that he wanted me to go and return at a later date. He and Torunkai would throw it around and see 
how if he permitted such equipment to come to the country how it could come be moved out almost immediately to the point on the Sierra Leone Liberian border to enter and making sure that it was all out he had to work that out in his own head first uh, and then uh, work it out with uh, with a uh, Torunkai uh, to see how it will work and so I left uh, Sierra Leone only to return at a later date and uh, how soon after did you return I went I returned I would approximately uh, say after about two months I returned because by this time the men were through with training and one thing you get to learn when you train people for a mission you send them out to carry the mission if not they get lazy they get tired and they probably forget what you know what the line and these are soldiers and so I returned after two months at a very bad time why uh, Momo had traveled to London I think there was a donors conference and so I arrive I meet with uh, Dumuya I meet with uh, Brigadier Torunkai but at that time there was a very uh, <clears throat> how do I call him a very uh, tough terrible guy that was the inspector general of police by the name of Bambi Kamara I think he's late Bambi Kamara I do not know whether Bambi worked for do or whatever but there is a sense that any one of us entering Sierra Leone meant something, and apparently Do had established good intelligence in Sierra Leone. I arrived there, President Momo is out of the country. Bami Komara arrests me. Now, there is a problem here. Tarankai knows the whole deal. Dumbuya knows the whole deal. But Dumuya in the SSD is a member of the police. And he is only a junior assistant, I think, superintendent of police. So even though he's commanding the SSD, but he's low in the rank. So he cannot question Bambi. Tarankai is in a mess because his boss, the chief of staff, Major General Tarwale does not know about this deal. So Bame arrests me. They rush to Tarankai and Dumuya. Dumuya has to run for cover because he probably could have gotten arrested. Tarankai intervenes with Bame. Bame doesn't want to listen to Tarankai. He calls Tarwale. Tarwale doesn't know. Tarwale gets angry that this thing, uh, in fact, Tarankai tells him, oh, the president is aware that Mr. Taylor is here and he's invited him. And don't touch him, I know. So Tarawale is asking him, but what do you know? He can't tell him because the president doesn't want for Tarawale to know. So I'm stuck and I'm put in Pademaru prison. I'm there for about three days. Uh, Momo is informed by Tarankai. He rushes back, releases me, puts me on a plane, gets me out of the country immediately that ends the whole Sierra Union thing there are no arms there's nothing that come Sierra Union at that particular time is dead but Momo and I are still in contact but what do you mean you're still in contact oh Prince Barclay is taking messages from me to President Momo to Brigadier Tarankai who is still trying to say it's over he is saying oh uh, the news is out now so it's a risk so he kept delaying and delaying and delaying and may I say rightfully so because in fact the news had leaked by this time in Liberia Doe is already aware of this arrest and not knowing that I'm released is calling for Momo to extradite me to Liberia so this is the whole picture so with all of these things spilling the newspapers are covering it uh, Momo decides to just 
hold fast. So he's telling us that, look, you got to wait until this thing dies down. But in the meantime, the men are just getting nervous and they are stuck in Tripoli now for two years. So we decide that I will take another move. I'll make another move. But just to complete the circle at this point, did your arrest in Sierra Leone cause you to have any antipathy towards Momo? No, not at all, not at all, not at all. Uh, President Momo and I remain good friends. Uh, Momo was not responsible. In fact, he, he, was, he, he cut short uh, his, his, his trip to London because things were getting so much out of control, he had to rush back and control this himself. And we remain very good friends. No, no, he, if, if, if Momo had wanted to do evil to me, he would have turned me over the door. No, he remained my very good friend. Even when I launched the revolution in Liberia, uh, Prince Barclay was still getting messages uh, into Momo. No, he, he remained a very good friend of mine. And <clears throat> was he still your friend in 1991, March? Well, uh, not exactly. Um, by March of uh, 1991, uh, this situation occurred uh, where the, if I'm not mistaken, this is about the uh, uh, attack on Sierra Leone, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And uh, it, it was virtually impossible in all the attempts that I made to convince Momo, you know, um, and, 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 and this is why maybe it's good we, you know, we're in this court. You know, you, you, you have to distinguish between all the propaganda and the rumors and the lies. Here I am, you can blame Momo. There's an attack in, 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 in Sierra Leone, and I'm telling Momo, I don't know anything about it. But there are others telling Momo, oh, he does know about it. Uh, he, 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 it can't happen unless, unless you know. So finally, there is a problem because in about, I think around January, there had been a little looting incident on the border between Liberia and Sierra Leone, where the Sierra Leonean soldiers and our own soldiers had, a little, had, had, had an altercation over looted property. And so people just kept pumping Momo, oh, he must know, and if he, if he doesn't know, then who else would know? And this continued and continued, but this fighting was going on. That is what subsequently led to, uh, to uh, the Ulimo coming into Liberia. Because Momo was convinced, beyond reasonable doubt, I, I appeared, that uh, because his friend had done this to him, he had to do something too. And that's why he, he armed Ulimo. Then later on, I sought you know, to work with the RUF. So this is how all this happened, just on, okay, uh, it must be so, it's not so. And this happens all the time, you know, between countries, where one leader would accuse the other. It's got nothing to do with facts, but this is what happened. Now, during these travels around West Africa to Sierra Leone, for example, if you just described, where did you maintain your, your base, so to speak? In Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. Don't forget, Ghana is a no-no because they've already given me 48 hours. I'm, I'm never to go back there. So, I mean, so from the time of your release until the launch of the revolution in 1989, December, where are you based? Burkina Faso.
can I give us a, a spelling? James Bamba, B A M B A, Kamara, K M A R A. And what was his position? Uh, uh, well, I think it's, uh, I, where we used to call it Bambi, maybe it's Bamba, Bambi Kamara. He is uh, Inspector General of Police. Of which police? Of, of Sierra Leone. And I'm told, Mr. President, that the spelling for Toronka is T O R O N K A I. Thank you, Mr. Grubus. Can I, before I forget, ask that the two maps be marked for identification? Yes. Uh, yes, well, we'll, we'll make them... Uh, I think I can safely say uh, MFI 1, and uh, we'll make them uh, A and B. The, the, un the untitled map will be MFI-1A and the map uh, entitled Libyan Arab Jamahiriya will be MFI-1B. I'm grateful. Would that bit then be a convenient pa point? Yes, no? uh, we we we'll adjourn today and uh, continue at 9.30 tomorrow and uh, uh, Mr. Taylor, you're going to be hearing this every day, but it's something I must say. Uh, you, uh, you'll caution not to discuss your evidence with any other person. Thank you. We'll adjourn. All rise.